analogous to how we use our phones. Like, as I said, as I, as, I, as, as I had said in the previous lesson, that you could be here and then on your phone you type a WhatsApp message, and within a few seconds, the next the person you're sending that message to gets it. Or the message, or maybe a text message over your phone, whatever. And then it's just an electronic information that is sent to another person within the shortest time possible, and then there is communication. So that is what. That is similar to what we are going to look at today. The nerve impulse or nervous transmission, we look at how a body is able to communicate in an electrical way, how information is relayed through our body, to, through the CNS, the central nervous system, to bring about responses to changes in the external environment. Have you ever wondered, why is it that when you touch a hot object, you remove your hand immediately? Why shouldn't you... Uh, why, why shouldn't you uh, uh, keep holding the hot object? I mean, when you touch a hot charcoal, a red hot charcoal, you could just hold it more as it burns you and you're, you're not bothered. But every time you touch a hot object, you ought to remove your hand or to jerk away your hand. Or when you step on a thorn, you ought, you ought to remove your very fast your leg. Or maybe when you encounter something that is so scaring, like maybe you, you're walking and you suddenly see a snake, you immediately run away. What happens? And that response is always very sudden or very immediate. That is why we are going to look at nervous transmission. We look at how our body communicates to the external environment in an electrical manner or in an electrical way in the shortest time possible there is. So that is nervous transmission, electrical communication within the body system using electrical messages. So a nerve impulse. We can't talk about nervous transmission and we miss out what you call a nerve impulse. All an impulse, whatever it is. Remember, in the first lesson we looked at a stimulus, we looked at a receptor, we looked at an effector, and then we also had to look at an impulse. A receptor as a group of specialized cells that receive a stimulus, change it into an impulse that is going to be sent to your central nervous system for it to respond to it. And then an impulse being an electrical signal, something like that. And then an effector, that group of specialized cells that will receive information from the central nervous system and effect a response to a stimulus. So here we are going to focus more on the nerve impulse. A nerve impulse simply means a way of uh, the way in which information is transmitted along a nerve cell. Remember we said we have three nerve cells, the sensory nerve cell, the motor, and then a neuron, and then the relay neuron. So those neurons, how information is relayed along the neurons is what uh, we are going to look at. It's that information that is relayed or transmitted across a neuron from one point to another is what you call a nerve impulse. However, that information is often relayed across that neuron in an electrical way. Therefore, the major definition of a nerve impulse is an electrical message that is transmitted along a neuron. Uh, some books have different uh, books have different spelling, uh, sorry, spellings of neurons. Some people can have E at the end of a neuron, and some books will not have E, whatever. So, an, a nerve impulse is simply an electrical message, an electrical information. That is why it is very fast. That is why immediately you touch a hot object, you remove your hand very fast. That is why when you're stepping on a, th a thorn, you remove your leg very fast. Why? There is communication between the skin that has been pierced with a thorn or between the skin that has touched a hot object with your brain within the shortest time possible to bring about the response of you jerking away your hand or jerking away your leg from a thorn or from a hot object. So that message is often relayed across the neurons, which we said are the basic structure units of the central nervous system. 
So the electrical, um, uh, this electrical message in most cases along, uh, alongside a neuron, it's an electrochemical change. And that electrochemical change always occurs across a, the membrane of a neuron, what you call the axon membrane. How does it happen? It, the neuron, if you could look at the structure of a neuron, we said we have an axon. So this is the axon membrane through which the impulse is transmitted from, uh, towards the cell body across the axon. So when there is any stimulus that hits any of the receptors and then an impulse is fired, this electrical message, this electrical message is fired in your neuron as a result of changes in iron concentration across the neuron. I'd request the producer to post that picture on, on the screen of changes in iron concentration. Yeah, when you look at the, at the screen, you're having your neuron at the bottom and then they have magnified a small section of the neuron and particularly the axon of a neuron. When you look at that axon of a neuron, the ions, the, the, the neuron oftentimes is myelinated or it is surrounded by what you call a myelin sheath. We talked about it last time, which is a fatty substance that insulates the axon and the dendron of a neuron. So that myelin sheath is often permeable to ions and such ions in most cases are potassium and sodium ions. If you've heard of the word sodium potassium pump. So these ions, uh, the potassium and sodium ions are in charge of making the membrane of the axon have charges on them. Because these two are positively charged, their arrangement across the membrane of this axon brings about either the positive charge outside or the negative charge inside. So when the axon is at rest or when the neuron is not conducting any impulse, it is always its iron concentration is in that form. The inside of the axon is more negative and the outside of the axon is more positive. At that point, we have more sodium ions in the outside of the axon membrane and, uh, and more potassium ions inside. And because these are positive, definitely they are going to attract the negatively charged ions such as the chlorides that are going to increase the negativity inside the membrane. And so when it has that figure you're seeing that is measured by a volt, uh, voltimeter, that figure of negative 70 mu volts, this kind of an axon is said to be polarized polarized in such a way that the amount of the charge on the outer membrane is equal to the amount of the, sorry, the amount of the positive charge on the outside of the membrane is relatively equal to the amount of the negative charge on the inside of the membrane. So when the charge distribution between the e outside membrane of the neuron or the axon of a neuron is relatively equal to that of inside in terms of one being positive, the other one being negative, then that neuron is said to be polar or it's sub, sub, said to be polarized. And at that point, it is resting. It is in a resting phase. So naturally, our neurons are like that. They are voltage gated. What do I mean by voltage gated? They are charged. Their membranes are charged because of the different cations and, and uh, cations such as sodium and potassium ions that can either enter in or leave to change the charge across the membrane. So this electrical message that I'm talking about, it is electrical because of these charges. Because the membrane is charged, any information that passes through it is like electricity. Because when you're having your dry cells, you have the positive and negative terminal, the same happens here. Any information that passes across this neuron, it is in an electrical manner. And because it is electrical, the information is what you call a nerve impulse. So it's, it travels at a higher speed. A nerve impulse travels at a higher speed, but the speed with which this nerve impulse travels is not anywhere equivalent to the speed of the normal electricity. I'm So the, when you say it's an electrical message, you don't need to think of how electricity flows through a wire connected to an electric circuit. No, the electricity travels far much 
faster than this um, impulse. The impulse tra uh, travels at a rate of 90 meters per second, depending on the nature of your neuron. If the neuron is myelinated, the impulse travels faster than a non-myelinated neuron. Whereas electricity always travels at a rate of 1 uh, kilometers per second. So you can see this is in meters and this is in kilometers. This is 285,000 kilometers per second. That shows that electricity moves fa faster than a nerve impulse in your body. And that is why we should not relate the two. We shouldn't relate a nerve impulse in our body to electricity. However, a nerve impulse in our body travels at a rate faster than the normal blood flow. The rate at which the blood, uh, our blood flows within our body is a little bit slower than the rate at which a nerve impulse travels across a neuron. Remember I have said the nerve impulse is brought about by changes in the iron concentration between the outside membrane of a neuron and the inner membrane of a neuron. And these changes are a result of influx and efflux, influx entering and efflux moving out of the pot uh, positive ions, that is potassium and sodium ions in this neuron. If a neuron is not carrying any impulse, it's said to be resting. It's said to be in a resting phase, and it has a voltage of around 70 mil millivolts. And in most cases, the number of negative ions is equal to the number of positive ions. Negative ions inside the membrane is equal to the number of positive ions outside the membrane, making this neuron to be polar or to be uh, polarized. That is why we say this is a polarized neuron. However, this is when it is at rest. There is no impulse that is fired and that it is in this form. But for an impulse to be fired across this neuron, then there's going to be change in the charge here. The change will be in the, the positive and the negative charge inside and outside of the axon membrane. And this change is brought about by what you call um, environmental stimuli. So what happens to this neuron when um, you are stimulated? Oh, how is a nerve impulse fired across a resting neuron? So nerve impulses are brought about or for them to be, to, be, to be fired in a neuron, they are brought about by changes in the external environment or for them to be brought about, the, 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 the receptors or these neurons must be stimulated by a stimulus in the external environment. And examples of this stimulus, we said we have sunlight, density, sound, maybe pressure, maybe something that is mechanical, as I say, heat. So what happens is when the body, your body part that contains the receptors, it could be your eye, or it could be the ear, or it could be the skin. So when you touch a hot object, or maybe when you see something that is so exciting, now that is the stimulus that is going to bring about firing of an electric impulse in your neuron. But how does it do it? When you touch a hot object, when the receptor touches a hot object, or when your body touches a hot object. Surrounding the surface of your body is the skin. Now this skin contains a group of different receptors, such as pain receptors. These are receptors that are sensitive to pain. Then we have thermoreceptors. These are receptors sensitive to heat. And then we have mechanoreceptors sensitive to physical changes. We, then we have different kinds of chemoreceptors which are sensitive to Temp, uh, to chemicals. So when your skin touches a hot object, the thermoreceptors in your skin are going to be stimulated. However, when they are stimulated, it will disrupt the membrane potential of the neurons, which is basically the sensory neuron, until a given value is reached. That value, we call it the threshold value or the threshold potential. So the stimulation must be so strong that the threshold level is reached. So what is usually the, the value of the threshold level? It's 
In normal beings, in normal human beings, the threshold value to fire an electric impulse ranges between uh, negative 55 to 65. Some people it can go up to negative 50, but let us take negative 55. Remember a resting neuron, it is at negative 70. So when you touch a hot object, the Heat, uh, the heat receptors in your skin will get stimulated until the threshold value is reached, which is negative 55 millivolts. When this threshold value is reached, then an action potential or the membrane will get, de uh, will get depolarized. What happens will be this receptor will convert your stimulus into an electrical stimulus, what you call an impulse. And once an impulse is generated, it's generated upon the positive charge outside moving more, the inside becoming more positive compared to the outside. What happens is when you touch a hot object, the pain receptors or the heat receptors are stimulated. When they're stimulated, they're going to alter the membrane potential of the axon membrane such that more of the sodium ions that are outside will enter inside and the potassium will enter will move out and the uh, more sodium will enter than the potassium that are moving out making this inner membrane a little bit more positive and the outer membrane a little bit negative and so when this change in the charge of the neuron. Remember to rest the positive, the outside is more positive, the inner is more negative. But when there is, there is a stimulation, the outside, the membrane potential will be changed so that the outside becomes more negative and the inside becomes more positive. So this is voltage change. Once there is a change in the voltage of the membrane, then this membrane is no longer polarized, but it becomes depolarized. Depolarized, it means that the membrane loses its polar nature due to unequal distribution of the positive and the negative charges brought about by a stimulation by the receptors being stimulated by the stimulus in the external environment. So, so long as this alter and altered changes in the iron, uh, iron concentration across the membrane reaches a level, a value we call negative 55 millivolts, which you call the threshold value, then the stimulation will be enough to fire out what you call an electrical potential or an action potential or what you call a nerve impulse. So that is how a nerve impulse is fired in your neuron. So the nerve impulse will flow down this axon, like just like you see a wave flowing over the sea. It will keep on changing the iron concentration as it moves down the axon on the, between the inner axon membrane and the outer axon membrane. So as it moves down, the inner becomes more positive, the outer becomes more negative due to changes in the sodium potassium ion concentration. Why? More sodium ions will move out, three of them, and few potassium ions will move in, making the inner more negative than outer, altering the voltage or the potential difference across or what you call the charge, electrical charge between the inner and the outer membrane. And that is how an action potential or a nerve impulse is generated across a neuron. So that is, that is generation of a nerve impulse. Just to, to repeat a little, I said, I'm repeating. I said, when you touch a hot object, in surrounding your skin, we have what you call thermoreceptors, receptors that are responsible for sensing changes in heat in your external environment. So a hot object, it is heat. So when you touch it, the thermoreceptors surrounding your skin will be stimulated. So long as the stimulation reaches the threshold value, that is negative 55 millivolts across a neuron, an action potential or a nerve impulse will be generated. And how is this nerve impulse generated? Because, it's because that stimulation will bring about an equal distribution of charges across the membrane of your neurons, particularly here it's the sensory neuron. So in, in such a way that more sodium ions will move in, uh, inside and, and few potassium ions will move out. 
creating the inner membrane of the axon to be more positive, whereas the outer surface to be more negative. So this change in the charge or this potential gradient or uh, gradient in uh, the difference in the charge between the outer and the inner membrane is going to bring about firing of an action potential, what you call a nerve impulse, which is an electrical message. And so in that instance, your external stimulus will be converted into an electrical message that is going to be transported across the neuron to your sensory, to your central nervous system. So that is how now the electrical message keeps on moving across this sensory neuron. Then it moves towards the CNS where the information from the external environment is interpreted. Now, what will happen if your skin or the receptor is stimulated, but it, the stimulation does not reach the threshold value? If the stimulation is less than the threshold value, which is negative 55 millivolts, then there's no impulse or action potential that will be generated in your neuron. Why? Because the value is very, very low to cause an alternate, to, to alternate the iron concentration across the membrane of the axon. So for an action potential to be created for an impulse to be created the threshold value must be reached or it must be exceeded therefore for you to have enough impulse generated then the stimulation must be greater all equal to the threshold value this is common sometimes we are in an environment and sometimes your eyes are focusing on something totally different that you don't focus on another thing. Like maybe you could be watching TV and your eyes are on TV and you're even, you, oh, you're preparing something like tea. And maybe you end up pouring tea or maybe you end up breaking something. Why? Your focus is on TV and so the neurons that are being excited are the neurons that are relating to the TV. So that the other impulses that are Coordinating your brain to help you carry out the T process are not excited. The threshold level is not reached and then you don't pay attention to it. Or sometimes you've been in a, in a room where someone cracks a joke and to some people it's a joke. They all laugh, laugh out loud. But some people remain not laughing because it's not, it has not excited them. That excitation is not there. The level has not been reached. Or maybe you could be sleeping in the middle of the night and there is sound, uh, maybe a big earthquake and people run and for you don't hear and people in the morning are like, but didn't you hear the earthquake and you're aware? Yeah. But it, it shows that to those people who are sleeping, the sound of the earthquake or maybe a gunshot, it, 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 was, it stimulated their neurons and this value was reached to them and an impulse was generated and the information trans was transported to their brain and then they immediately woke up that there is something dangerous. To you, another person, the value was not reached and for you the impulse was not fired and there is no information that was sent to your brain. And that is why you remain unbothered. So it, it, this value must always be reached for you to respond to changes in the external environment and also the speed varies now as we are going to look at how an impulse is transmitted basing on the speed so this kind of transmission whereby a threshold value must be reached for an impulse to be generated is what you call the saltatory conduction here by sorry it's what, you, uh, it's a conduct, it, it's what brings about conduction of an impulse across your neuron. So if this is not reached, then an impulse will not be conducted. Now, let us look at how an impulse is transmitted. How is an impulse transmitted across a neuron? From one part of the body towards your central nervous system and then back for you to remove your hand.
So remember last time I showed you how these neurons are always arranged in our body. So we have three basic neurons. This is our central nervous system. Whenever I talk about central nervous system, what should come to your mind is the brain or maybe the spinal cord. So this is the sensory neuron. And then this is the motor neuron. And then this one here, in between the sensor and the motor neuron is what you call the relay neuron. Others call it the intermediate neuron. It's always located within the central nervous system or within our brain. The sensory neuron always has its cell body as an axon branch. And then the sensory neuron is always uh, connected to the receptors, such as the skin all the sense organs such as the eyes, and then the motor neuron is always connected to the effectors such as the muscle. So how is an impulse transmitted across a neuron through the central nervous system back to the effectors to bring about a reaction in your body? I start with the receptor, the skin. As I said earlier on, when you touch a hot object, the thermal receptors in your skin will be stimulated. When they get stimulated, uh, so provided that the threshold level is reached, an impulse will be fired here, which will be transmitted across your sensory neuron. And then the impulse will be jumping from one node of Ranvia to another, increasing the speed of conduction. And then it will move across the sensory neuron in form of an electrical message. Then it will reach the end of a sensory neuron where it will have to go to the brain or the central nervous system. But for it to enter the central nervous system, there is a gap here. This is the gap here we call a synapse. This gap, this electrical information conducted across or this impulse must come here across the synapse and then enters the relay neuron, which is in the central nervous system. When the impulse reaches the central nervous system, then the information this impulse is carrying will be interpreted by your brain. It will be integrated, it will be processed, and the feedback will be determined by your brain. After the feedback is determined, then the impulse is relayed across the relay neuron towards the motor neuron. But there is another synapse here, another gap. That this impulse, electrical impulse, crosses in a chemical way to the motor neuron. And then from the motor neuron, it moves downwards back to the effectors via the motor neuron. The effectors are always the glands and the muscles surrounding the part that touched a hot object. So when the impulse is coming across this, it's carrying a feedback information. So the glands or the muscles will be stimulated to contract. The muscles will contract and all of a sudden you get energy to withdraw your hand off a hot object. But when I'm speaking about this, it's as if it can take a whole day or it can take a whole night or maybe it will take a week. No. All this happens at a speed of 90 meters per second, meaning that this can occur in less than a second. Remember, a minute has 60 seconds. So for this to happen, it happens in less than a second. Imagine when you touch a hot object. Do you even spend a minute without removing your hand? So these are the series of events that take place in your body. And this is how an impulse is transmitted. But remember I said that speed of transmission of an impulse is more than the blood flow in your body, but then less than the, w the rate at which electricity is transmitted in your body. I would like the producer to relay on your screen uh, how impulses are transmitted across... Um, across a neuron by jumping from one node of Ranvia to another, as we shall see later on. The next pic. 
Yeah, I think, yeah, that one. So this is how an impulse moves. Remember, our neuron is always myelinated. It is covered by myelin sheaths. But there are certain parts on a neuron that are not myelinated. Those are the nodes of Ranvia. So depolarization or the action potential or what you call our impulse only occurs at the nodes of Ranvia, whereby the impulse would jump from one node of Ranvia to another, making transmission to be faster. So the impulse moves across this neuron if your neuron is myelinated, this is the myelin sheath. This is the node of Ranvia, myelin sheath, node, node of Ranvia. So the impulse jumps from here, it goes here, it goes here. It does not go through the myelinated part because it's already insulated. So, excuse me. So this jumping from one node of Ranvia to another increases the speed across which an impulse is being transmitted. It keeps on jumping. So if your nerves or your neurons are not myelinated, then the speed of transmission, this speed is very low. And the moment the speed of impulse transmission in your body is very low, then you're always going to be interpreting things at a lower rate. Your logical expressions will be very low. And every time you cannot grasp concepts at a faster speed. You've seen those students in, in, in school. There are students who grasp information at a faster rate. Within the shortest time, they have understood this, honestly. And there are some of us who are going to struggle to understand this. It will take us like some good time of explaining, going backwards and forth, backwards and forth. Because to some of us, the speed of transmission of our nervous impulses across our neurons is very fast, faster than 90. It can go up to 100 meters per second. But then there are others which comes backwards, depending on whether the different neurons are myelinated or not. So speed of transmission is very, very important. So what are the factors that affect speed of transmission of an impulse? One of them is temperature. If temperature is high, then the speed at which impulse information is transmitted across a neuron also increases faster. And so you're going to have a lot of uh, faster response to changes in the external environment. Then the other thing is axon diameter here. And this is common to even us naturally in our population. When the diameter of the axon of your neuron is bigger, a bigger diameter, the faster the speed of impulse transmission. Such people always perceive information very fast. They are fast learners. And then if the diameter of your axon is low, is smaller, then the speed of transmission is also a little bit lower. And then you are going to be affected in interpreting particular information. That is why you find that in class, some of us interpret faster, others less. Why? the speed of transmission of impulses across our neurons differs. To some of us, we, the diameter is very small, others' the diameter is very large. Then the other thing is myelination. I said if the neuron is myelinated, then impulses are going to jump from one node of Ranvia to another. They will not go through the myelinated part. So that one further increases speed of transmission of an impulse in a neuron. So you have to know that the our level of perceiving things may be different based on how we are wired. Particularly, sometimes we could be in class and someone cracks a joke. Immediately, people bursts out, they burst out and they laugh. And then after people are keeping quiet and gaining back to normal, after like five minutes, then someone bursts out in laughter. That person has just perceived that information after a time while others have already perceived it. So that is what you call impulse transmission. I want us to pay attention now to this gap here. We call a synapse. The impulse flows in an, it's an electrical message. But when it reaches this gap, we call a synapse. It becomes a chemical. It has to cross here in a chemical way, in a chemical manner. Remember, synapses are just simple gaps, gaps between neurons. They just connect neurons together. They are, like, they are like gaps or junctions across which one neuron communicates with another. Take for instance here, this is the sensory neuron, 
and it's going to communicate with the relay neuron. So it's communicating via this gap we call the synapse. There is another gap between the relay neuron and the motor neuron. So the communication between two neurons is always via a synapse. So what is a synapse? I request the producer to project it on your screen. So I will not go into much details of a synapse here. You find this, for those who do biology at a level, you find much more details on a synapse. So I'd request the producer to project the synapse on a screen. Uh, the first picture that he had put. The f uh, no, 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 the one before. That one. So that is a brief drawing of a synapse. When you look at it, we're having two kinds of knobs. Excuse me. One swollen tip up and another one down. They are separated by a gap. That gap is what you call uh, the synaptic cleft. So the synapse simply means there is it's a gap across which information from one neuron moves to another neuron in a chemical way. How does that happen? When um, electrical information, when an impulse reaches the tip of one of the neurons, say the sensory neuron, this is its knob. So when it reaches this part here, it makes the membrane, which we call the presynaptic membrane here, to get depolarized by changing the concentration of ions calcium, positively charged ions, it opens the gates of this so that there's more influx of ions, positively charged ions, particularly calcium ions inside. And this, once this membrane is depolarized, it's going to make a few of these, these are vesicles here, they contain a chemical we call a neurotransmitter substance. An example of a neurotransmitter substance we have is acetylcholine. This will be released from this. It's a chemical that is released from these vesicles. And once it is released, it diffuses, or it, it diffuses with this membrane and releases these chemicals containing our impulse converted into a chemical way. So the moment the impulse reaches here, depolarizes this membrane, the neurotransmitter substance is released, which will carry our impulse in a chemical way. And then the impulse will move across this gap we call the synaptic cleft to the next neuron here. This was sensory, so this is our relay neuron. Or this could be a muscle. So this next neuron here has what you call receptors that will, rece that will receive the neurotransmitter substance here. And the moment these are stimulated, an, an, an action potential will be fired here so that the impulse is then converted back into an electrical form and then it will continue. But the neurotransmitter substance is not taken for it. The en it there's an enzyme that will break it down and then it is absorbed back into the presynaptic knob. So for an impulse to cross from one neuron to another, it must be converted into a chemical way. And that is what you call a chemical synapse. For it to be converted, it, it reaches this, depolarizes this membrane. By depolarizing the membrane, I mean it changes the charge on the membrane. By having more positive ions enter, and once this is, the charge is changed, the Vesicles here are going to fuse with this membrane, releasing a neurotransmitter substance, which is going to carry our impulse in a chemical way across this gap. 
to the next neuron where it will be received by receptors, depolarizing this membrane, and then it will be converted back into an electrical impulse that is taken further away from the neuron. So I would still request the producer to project it on your screens. So that is, that is what we are looking at. The upper swollen tip being our presynaptic knob from one neuron, and the lower one being the postsynaptic, as you can see, pre before the synapse and post after the synapse. Simply the synapse is that gap in between. So the synaptic vesicles are the ones that are containing those green dots. The green dots are the neurotransmitter substances, which is a chemical substance. So this chemical substance fuses with the membrane and then across the impulse is transmitted in a chemical way to the next knob or to the next neuron where it is converted back into an electrical impulse. So I don't want to have a lot on that. I said for the people who are going to do biology at a level, you're gonna have a lot of this in, in, in your explanations, more of this, of it being detailed. For us, we should only know that an, a synapse is a gap between two neurons across which impulses cross in a chemical way. That gap enables communication between two neurons within your body. It could not only be neurons, it can be between a neuron and a muscle. So that is as simple as a synapse. And what are the functions of synapses? Why should we have synapses? In a and yet how many synapses do we have in a body? Synapses in a body, these junctions here could be as many as millions. Like in our brain, we have trillions, close to a thousand trillion of synapses across which different neurons communicate with one another. But what is the function of this synapse? The first function is it enables information. Actually, first of all, it enables communication between two neurons or between a neuron and a muscle. There must be communication. So several neurons in our body are connected differently within our brain, within our spinal cord and different body parts or between the brain and the muscle. So communication between neurons is as a result of synapses. I request the producer to put that on the screen, the synapse. And then we see how important it is. No, 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 no. That one. So that is the definition. We say it's a place where impulses are transmitted from one neuron to another. And they said they are made up of three structures, the synaptic knob, which is the swollen tip, synaptic clefts, which is the gap, the plasma membrane. And then inside them, there's a neurotransmitter substance, which is a chemical that aids the synapse to cross from one neuron to another. So the function being, it enables communication between neurons. The other function is, it ensures that impulses flow in one direction. So it ensures that always there should be one part that is from where the impulse is coming from to where the impulse is going. It can never be reversed. So it ensures unidirectional flow of information or impulses. And then the other thing is, it's very important because it allows numerous interconnections between neurons and then enabling numerous con uh, communications in your body. That means you can have a single impulse bring about several responses from you. Take for instance, you can, you could be eating, you could be walking, you could be speaking. You're doing several things at the same time. Or you could be dancing, or you could be walking, uh, sorry, dancing, eating, and even communicating to a person. Th so for you to be doing different things at the same time is as a result of synaptic information or syn uh, synapses because they enable connections between neurons, several different neurons in your body. But then how do drugs, the drugs we eat, sorry, we take, people take alcohol, People take cocaine, people take um, um, amphetamines, people take marijuana, people take injaga. How do drugs affect this uh, transmission of synaptic information? You've heard people say when they take alcohol, they become more active. They are not shy. When you've, you've heard people say when they take sets, particular drugs like marijuana or injaga, 
they can remain awake, they are alert all the time, or someone can dig uh, several, um, a very big chunk of land on inference of drugs. How do drugs affect synaptic transmission? Some drugs are excitatory and some drugs are inhibitory. So some of them will inhibit the neurotransmitter substance from moving down or some of them will increase the rate at which the neurotransmitter substance moves down. So if a drug is excitatory, it will mimic this chemical. So whether the chemical is produced or not, you will always have impulses flow. And that is how people take Viagra and then someone gets an erection overnight, a week, because there is numerous contractions and there is numerous always a transmission of impulses in their body. So drugs can mimic the chemicals in a body and bring about excitation that is unending or numerous contractions or tra uh, nervous transmissions that are unending. And maybe some of them can inhibit this chemical from being produced and so no impulse will be fired. So whereas people are responding to a particular change, people are running away from a bomb blast or a gunshot, someone's just standing, not knowing what is happening yet people are reacting. So drugs can inhibit or can excite the rate at which the neurotransmitter substance is formed or the rate at which the neurotransmitter substance is broken down to prevent or to allow reaction to changes in the external environment. There are very many other functions, sorry, there are many other effects of drugs on synaptic transmission, however, in the next lesson, I'll start from there. In the next lesson, when I come here, we are also going to look at reflex actions. What are those actions that we do, oftentimes unaware, that are sudden, and you're not aware of them? And then we shall look at conditioned reflexes, such actions that we do intentionally, and we think about them, and then we, bring, uh, we do them. How, do they, uh, how are they brought about? So in the next lesson when I come, up, uh, I come again, sorry, I come back here, we are going to look at how drugs affect synaptic transmission, the other points, reflex actions and conditioned reflexes. Just to reminisce, today we have looked at the nerve impulse. How is it generated? We've looked at how an impulse is transmitted across a neuron. We have looked at the synapse and the functions of the synapse. We have not completed effects of synapse, sorry, effects of drugs on synaptic transmissions. And the reference question for today is UNEB 1996, paper one, question number 38. If you're able to do that number, you'll have understood what I have told today, and you will not have challenges in the next coming lessons about nervous transmission. Once again, the textbook that I used uh, was uh, Macmillan Secondary Biology, Jeff Howard, 2000 edition, the international edition, Forgotten My Country. <laughs>